And we come now to God's holy and blessed word. Have you been reading his word this year? Started reading his word? Read it. It will bless your heart. It'll bless, it'll bless your soul. It will bless your heart. This is what's on my, my heart and my life today. And, and let me just say this. Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. You say, why did you say that, Pastor? Because that's what we're going to talk about today. Right. We not only can get an amen, we have an amen. amen. And this amen is a person. His name is the amen. I'm going to talk about the amen, the faithful God. That's my title today. The amen. The faithful God. And I want to talk about what that means to us. It means three things, at least. At least that's the things that I want to bring out. What does God's faithfulness mean to us? How does it impact our lives? How does it, how does it fuel our lives? How does it comfort our lives? How does it strengthen? Does it, what does it mean to us as we walk out this faith in Jesus Christ? Christ, what does it mean to have a God who is a faithful God? Well, I think that we definitely would all agree on this. We're living in challenging times. The last two years have been incredibly challenging. Even today, I had a pastor friend from Forney. Their whole church is shut down. And I said, we're praying for you, and I, I will pray for him. And then I, was, I saw an announcement uh, from the church in New York, a church that I love, Brooklyn Tabernacle, Completely shut down until later this month. Challenging times that, that we're in. It's challenging for pastors. Uh, my heart goes out to these pastors. But our world has, uh, has been shaken. This, this thing that's happened in our, our world has touched everywhere from the, from the White House to our house to pastors and churches and politicians and families and individuals and businesses and all. And, all. and I think the, the word that I think about is there's an uncertainty. There just feels like there's an uncertainty in many people's lives today. This, this kind of uncertain feeling of, you know, what's going to happen next? And I think we've all experienced that. And I think on top of that, there's, this, there's been this steady stream of, of misinformation and you wonder, like, is this real? Who's telling me the truth? Is this information true? And I think it's caused and it's created in the minds of millions of Americans kind of a, a mistrust in, in certain power structures. The words that come to my mind when I think about this season of a, of in our world, it's words like this. Many people are fearful. There's, a, there's an anxiety. There's a fearfulness. There's an uncertainty, as I've said. There's a weariness to all of this. There's kind of a weariness that's weighed down upon each of our lives. Like, like how much more? When's this gonna, when are we going to cross the finish line of this stuff? There's been a loss of hope. There's also been a, been a word that I would use is isolation. We kind of feel isolated. And I thought about it on the way to church this morning. I'm, I'm an affectionate person. I like to hug people's necks and shake people's hands in, in, a, in, a, in a godly Christian affection. You know, the Bible, they gave a kiss. We don't do that, thank the Lord. But they greet one another with a holy kiss. But that was just, it meant affection. And I realized something driving to church this morning. You know, we've gotten away from that because of, of, of you know, carefulness with our health and different things. And I think we've lost something. We've lost something. We're the family of God. We should be, this is to be the most loving, affectionate, godly love and affection and place in the world. God's house is a house of love. We've experienced his love. We want to know his love. We want to express his, his love in godly ways. And we've lost something. And I think because of that, there's like this isolation that you can feel even around people. You feel like there's, there's like this distance, distance that's between us. But for a few moments this morning, what I want to do is I want to, in a sense... Get us back on our solid spiritual ground in a sense, hopefully. I want to, to talk about a truth today that may can reinvigorate us, our hope, can renew our peace, revive our purpose. And there's a little verse tucked in 
the, the Revelation, which is the most hopeful book in the Bible, as you read the Revelation, it's, it's you know, we, get, we, get, we lose the forest for the trees, kind of, or so to speak. And, but we don't see that it's about Jesus because we're looking for the Antichrist or we're looking for whatever this weird symbol is. But if we get up at the, you know, the 10,000 foot view, we can see the hope of the victory that God gives his church. And really, the, the message of the revelation is this. The church will come out on top. The church will win. Because the 144,000 are seen in heaven before God in white robes. That's the people of God. We win. And, we, and if we're not careful, what happens is we can't see the forest for the trees. We, all the confusion, all the things that are happening around us. And we don't realize that we're winning. Though it may not look like it in the natural, we will win. The church will win in Jesus' name. But there's an amazing verse. And maybe you can tuck it in your heart this week. But it's Revelation 3.14. And this will be on the screen for us. It says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now, Laodicean church had some problems. They had, a, they had some people that were faithful there, but they had many people that were lukewarm. They had many people that were self-centered. They were probably people of means, it seems like, because they said, you know, we don't need anything, but yet they had a lot of needs. And then here's what the Lord says. These things says the amen. These, what a, weird, what a strange way to say things. These things say the amen. I didn't know an amen could say anything. But who, but who this is, this is Jesus speaking here. Do you realize these are the most direct words in the Bible to the church? There is no place in the entirety of God's word where there's more of a direct statement to the church than the three letters in the second and third chapter of the Revelation, the seven letters. He says these things, says the amen, the faithful witness and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. It's the title of Jesus. So can I get an amen again? Come on. Let's talk about the amen, the faithful God. In the Old Testament, the word faithful comes from A-M-A-N, amen, amen. We get in the New Testament with an E in the English, A-M-E-N, and it just means the so be it or the, the support. The, it's the amen. It's the so be it. And whatever, what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 1.20, it says all the promises are amen. In other words, everything God says is an amen. And the reason is because he backs it up with his power, with his, with his all-knowing, with his, with his promises, his character, his faithfulness, what he says he's going to do. So it's, it's so be it. It's going to happen in his timing and his purpose. It's the amen. He says this, all the promises of God in him are yes and amen to the, to, to the glory of God through him. Fifteen times in the New Testament where, where the word pistos is where we get the word faithful, and, and 15 times it refers to the nature of God. God is faithful. God is faithful. Now, there's a great verse in, in the saddest book in the Bible, and that's the book of Lamentation. But this verse just jumps out of the darkness of Lamentations. It jumps out of the pain and the disappointment of Lamentation. It's... it's Jeremiah's weeping, and all of a sudden, this verse springs up through the Holy Spirit to his heart. It says in Lamentations 3, 22, through the, through, the Lord's, though, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. Now, you have to understand where Jeremiah is. Everything around him is burned down. The people are, it is so bad that I don't have words to describe how bad it is. I can tell you this, mothers are eating their children, literally. Literally, ladies, mothers are eating their children. Worst thing you've ever seen. Jeremiah's in the middle of all this, all this confusion, all this darkness. And the Holy Spirit says this to him. Verse 23, because of your compassions, they fell not. Verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
I mean, just think about it. In the midst of your worst trial, your worst pain, the worst news you could receive, the worst trials you've ever been through, that's what Jeremiah's going through in the middle of that. He says, God is faithful. Amazing. Often the Lord reminds us of his faithfulness. You know, sometimes, you know, serving the Lord is like a marathon. It's not like a, now in America, and in, in, in not trying to be in kind, but in many American Christians, it's like a, it's like a sprint. It's like a hundred yard dash. I want it now, now. And they don't understand the ways of God's cogs turn slow sometimes. God's, God's patient. God takes a long time to do things. A day of the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. And he calls us to wait on him. Most American Christians don't want to wait for anything. But I want to tell you this. There's times that the Lord will remind you that the thing, listen, the things you've done for him through the years, they haven't been in vain. You have prayed prayers that you thought God didn't answer, but he, but he has heard those prayers. And he will answer in his time. The things you've done that you've, you've completely forgotten about. You've forgotten about them. Maybe you taught a little class to some little old, little old kid. I mean, even we ministered to Sam, and he came in. I thought, I don't even, who are you? I didn't even know who he was. You've gotten better looking, so I didn't know who you were. You yeah, I remember you now. But things that we don't remember that God remembers. For instance, I, I, received, I, I received a text this morning. <clears throat> I received a text this morning from someone in Colorado. And this is someone I ministered to 35 years ago. Now, I know most of you didn't think I was above 35, but hey, just, I know, I know how it is. So, but anyway, 35 years ago, and, and this was a text that they had previously sent me. And this person sent me a text on the anniversary of his salvation. And here's the text. I'm going to read you something else he sent me this morning. He sent me this some time back. Here's what he says. He said, Thank you, sir, for being a witness for Christ. I still remember you coming to my junior high, my junior high and playing basketball with us lost kids. I remember you showing me, demonstrating to me how to witness and share my faith at Mazio's Pizza to our waiter. I don't remember that. You didn't just tell me you trained me, and I've had the privilege to train hundreds of youth and college students later to share their faith in tough, unbelieving communities. Thank you for always being on fire and giving me a vision for the lost. May Christ bless you abundantly for discipling me. And today, that young man, he's not young anymore, he's tall and bald-headed, and, uh, but he sent, me a, that was some time, he sent me a text this morning, and he said to me, uh, he said this, and what I'm talking about is this, the Lord will remind you that what you do for him is not in vain. The things that you faithfully served him with, in his faithfulness, it's not in vain. It's not voided. And he sent me this this morning. Now, he is a Christian businessman in Colorado. And he said, uh, he greets me. And then he says, by God's grace, he said, I'm in the mountains the last couple of days praying, setting a couple of goals for my life. He said, tonight, I'll have our annual store dinner. And he said, they will announce my promotion. And I'll get to speak to 225 employees tonight on Proverbs 1, 22.1. So he's a faithful Christian businessman. Here's what he says. Our God is so gracious and merciful, even when I've made so many mistakes. He said, I thank God you chased me at Duncan, in the Duncan schools. You came to my house. You kept pursuing me, and when, even when I didn't want to be found, and that's true, he did not want to be found. Because of you, I have a hunger for the word, and I've completed my 16th year of reading through the Bible. Because of your modeling, I have always had a burden and a passion to share Christ where I go, and, still, and I still train youth to do so as, as a volunteer in my church now. Um, he said, no, I don't remember this, but he says, this is 35 years ago now, you got to realize, I can't, I couldn't even remember Sam. So here's what he said. He said, um, sorry. 
He said, I remember when we were in youth service, you quoted Psalm 91, and, your, and, then, and then your quote that you said after that, he said, it still haunts me. And this, this was a quote that I quoted that somebody else had said, but I said this, the world has yet to see a man or woman 100% sold out. What they can do, the world is yet to see what God can do with someone who's 100% sold out to them. And that was actually a D.L. Moody quote, or actually someone quoted it to D.L. Moody. He says, I'm still surrendering and, 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 and falling forward to be one of those. Bless you and thank you for thinking. Thank you for service. So, and I got that this morning. And I thought, you know, I had forgotten about those things, those seeds I'd sown, those times that I would go to those high schools and spend time playing with basketball with those lost kids and, and chasing this. His name is Jesse and I would chase him down. I would ask his mother if he was, uh, if he was home after, yeah, come on over. He would, would see me, and he'd run out the back door, and he'd ride away on his bike. And, and he, this went on for a long time. But finally, God got a hold of him. And that young man right there, not so young anymore, he literally has trained hundreds and hundreds of youth workers and hundreds of kids. You know, what we do, you know, we don't know who we're planting into. We don't know, you know, you may not reach thousands, but you may reach someone that reaches thousands. And then God gets all the honor and all the glory and all the honor and praise. What I'm telling you, can I get an amen? Come on. Because we serve the amen. We serve the so be it. We serve the faithful God. He is a faithful God. Amen. amen. I thought of a story this morning of uh, Sister Carol Cimbala. And I've just respected the symbolists through the years. Amazing people. They serve at Brooklyn Tabernacle for 50 years, I guess. I remember she told a story. She wrote a song from this story. And this was a time, a very dark time in their lives. Their oldest daughter had turned her back on God. And they were so busy that they didn't realize what was spiritually happening in her life. And... How I many you know you can be right in the middle of church and backslide away from God? You can be in the ministry backslide, backslide. We've seen that over the last couple of years. Pastors of large mega churches come out as atheists. They say, I don't even believe in God anymore. And yet they were preaching every week to thousands of people. That ought to tell you something. That ought to be a warning to all of us. Well, her da- their daughter turned her back on the Lord and stopped serving the Lord. Ran away from home. And got connected with this older man, got pregnant, and it was just a very, that for a long, long time, they didn't even know where she was. They would cry out to God, where are you, God? Lord, we've served you. We've tried to be faithful here in the inner city of Brooklyn. Lord, we, we've sacrificed so much here, and we've served you. We've been faithful. And Lord, it, it's like you're not hearing our prayers. Where's our daughter? And they would cry out to God and cry out to God. And then to ins, insult to injury. Sister, Sister Simula was diagnosed with cancer during this same dark time. And here she is laying in a Brooklyn hospital with cancer. Daughter gone. There's just like their whole life had been engulfed in darkness. And she does what we would have done. She starts having a pity party. <laughs> why this and why that and why are we going through this? And it was there laying on that hospital bed that the Lord dropped the song In her heart, he is faithful. He is faithful, faithful to me. It was there in a hospital bed with the diagnosis of cancer. Their daughter gone where they don't even know with some some ungodly man. And it just seemed like darkness had engulfed them. In the middle of that shines the faithfulness of God. Just like Jeremiah, through the darkness, through the disappointment, through the downturns, through the questions, all of a sudden, once again, the amen shows up, the so be it shows up, the God of faithfulness shows up, and he said, I'm here, and I never change. I never change. Amen. And through all of that, the backside of that story is their daughter did come home. One night, their church, their church has prayer meeting every Tuesday night, it's different than our prayer meeting. I thank God for you that show up. You know, the few that show up there, a couple thousand will show up for a prayer meeting. On the subway, 
the inconvenience of the subway, shoulder to shoulder, stinky people, rain, hot. They come from all over that city of New York. Why? Because that church believes in prayer. And it's, it's amazing. I can't even go into it. But anyway, one night, you know, they prayed for this young lady a long time. And finally, it was one of those things that the pastor's wife, they, weren't want, they don't want to be the center of everything. They don't want to be their need every time they come together. So they kind of suffered quietly. And then uh, the story was that on, on, on one of those Tuesday night prayer meetings, one of the faithful, godly ladies of the church uh, got the pastor's attention and said, Pastor, I really feel like we need to pray for Chrissy tonight, right now, we need to pray for her. And so he yielded to that word, felt like it was the Lord. And he's in that, in that story, they said that that church went into intercession. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you been a part of people like that? Not just people that just pray, but it was like, it was like travail, a spirit of travail fell. That, that whole church, it was like a birthing room. It, they, they cried out to God. There was tears. There was wailing. There was mourning as they, were, as they were reaching to God for this young lady. That was on a Tuesday night. And before that week, and they didn't know where she was for months on end. Before that night was, before that week was over, Sister Simbola went upstairs to, to the Pastor Jim and said, Chrissy's downstairs. And he went down there. And one of the first things she said is this, who prayed for me? Who, somebody prayed for me. And she told him an experience that she had and what the Lord had done in bringing her back. Prayer works. Why? Why does prayer? It's not, it's not just about prayer. It's the God of faithfulness that we pray to. It's the amen that we pray to that is alive and real and hears our prayers. And he will move heaven and earth when he hears the desperate cries of his people. He hasn't changed. The church has changed. You know, we're wanting to treat the church and we want to treat God like a drive through And he said, no, no, it's a 20-course meal. It takes time to work in my kingdom. But God did that. I wish I could play that for you. They'd probably knock us off line for some kind of copyright deal. But anyway, I'm going to tell you there's a God whose word is his bond. Yes. There's a God that we serve today that you can, you can trust him completely. He's faithful in all things. Time does not change him. Amen. Circumstances does cha doesn't change him. He knows no vocabulary like hard or difficult or impossible. Those are not in his vocabulary because he's faithful in all that he is and all that he does. So let me drop just three little thoughts to you, and I'll be brief on each one. What does this faithfulness mean? And I've already really preached it, but number one is this. What his faithfulness means is this. It means that when I pray, I can pray with absolute confidence. When I get on my face before God and I pray for our church, our family, or our, 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 our board members, or I pray for our workers, or if I pray for some lost person somewhere or some missionary somewhere, I don't have to get down and be you know, indecisive and, oh, I wonder this. You know, we don't serve a God like the mythological gods. You know, if you remember studying Greek mythology in, in school and, and the gods are just temperamental, you don't know how they're going to be this day or that day, you know, just whatever. We serve a God that is the real God. We serve a God that when we pray, he's a God that's unchanging. And one of the ways that he's revealed himself is he is a faithful God. And he hears our prayers. Listen to this amazing verse. Here's another little verse you need to tuck away in your heart this week. Psalm 143 verse 1. 143 verse 1. Hear my prayer, David says. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplication. In your faithfulness, answer me. You can tell, you can tell David had prayed before. David had already had some answers to prayer. He knew, I'm, Lord, you did it before. You're faithful. I'm coming back again with another need in my life today. Dear brothers and sisters, you can pray with confidence. But you, you, you're not going to go to God today and then, you know, tomorrow he'd be something different. Or tomorrow he'd be moody or like, you know, whatever. No, no. 
He's a loving God. And he says, would you come visit me? Come. And it's just, just simple, simple prayer. Simple prayer. The psalmist says in Psalm 50, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Psalm 91, 15, he shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and I will honor him. Jeremiah 29, 12, then you shall call upon me and go and pray to me and I will, and I will listen. Oh, brothers and sisters. Your prayers are never wasted. Never wasted time. No, listen, no time spent in the presence of the Lord is ever wasted. Because God is the amen. Because he's the faithful God. When you pray, you can have maximum faith. You can have faith that mountains are being moved. You can have faith that prayers are being answered. You can have, pray, you can have faith that provision is coming. You can have faith that you're safe in his presence. Why? Because he's the living God. Jesus, our Lord. Here's the second thing, and I'll be quick. The second thing about God's faithfulness, and how it affects us, is that because of his, he's a faithful God, we can conquer all evil and temptation in our lives. God has revealed himself as deliverer. And I think it's, it's an important characteristic and quality that he possesses that he's revealed to us that we should embrace during the season. Listen to Thessalonians 3.3. 3. It says, but the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. He's talking about this one. The Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. The, notice again, the faithfulness of God connected with his delivering presence. Thessalonians, listen, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you where the enemy will not move you. He will guard you from the evil one. He's faithful. And then we're taught to pray this. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We should pray that every day. Listen, the Satan doesn't take a break. Those little imps of hell, those little, his little demons don't take a break. They want to harass us. They want to torment us, but we will not allow that because we are, we're going to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Deliver our families, our marriages, our children. Deliver our church from the evil attacks of the enemy. And then I love Corinthians. No temptation. And that word is thalipsis, and it means the pressures. The pressure, like a, like a, a paperweight. It mean, that's what it means. If, you could, if there was paper here, thalipsis in the Greek means pressure. It's like a paperweight. And we feel that, don't we? We feel that. You and I all both feel that at times, the pressures of trials and temptation, but it's not overtaking you. Except such is common to man, but God is faithful. There it is again. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the thalipsis, with the temptation, will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We serve a faithful God. You say, where is he? He's with you in the trial and the struggle. He knows the pressure points. He knows how much you can handle. And he will not allow it to overcome you because he's the amen, the faithful God. Amen. I love Timothy. If we are faithless, he is faithful. It, listen, if we are faithless, he is faithful. No one, can, no one has to point out any unfaithfulness in me. I know it all. We all know our unfaithfulness. There's times when we haven't prayed like we should. We haven't lived as close to God as we would want to. There's times that we failed in serving him. But you, no one can ever accuse God of that. He's perfectly faithful. And one of the areas that he's faithful in that I just love about him as the Bible says in John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to, to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And there's no one in this room that's ever truly approached the Lord and said, Lord, I failed you. And I'm sorry. There's not one person in this room that failed to walk away with mercy and cleansing and forgiveness. Not because of what you are but because of our faithful God to dispense his blood. How many know his blood still cleansing? Shouldn't we tell the world that? 
Shouldn't we? I mean, isn't that the message to the world? To the, come on, to the, to the broken, to the broken, to the undone, to those that have damaged their own life with their stupidity and their bad choices and they feel like there's no hope. Shouldn't we just announce it on the housetop that the blood of Jesus still cleanses from all sin? He's still a merciful God if we will come and be recipients of his mercy. He's faithful in the time of our trial. He says, God's our refuge and strength, the very present help in our trouble. And then thirdly, I'll leave this with you. Because of God's faithfulness, because he's the amen, you and I can have courage to face a very fearful world. I just refer to Jeremiah again. Lamentations is the saddest book in the Bible. You know, don't, don't read it today. You get a little depressed. I mean, it's really depressing until you get to chapter 3 and you know, you're brought out into the, the light of God's faithfulness. It's some of the most heart-wrenching, depressing words. You say, why is that? I think Jeremiah probably felt like his ministry was in vain. How would you like for God to call you the ministry? And the Lord to say to you, okay, I'm calling you the ministry, and here's what I want to tell you. You're going to preach 40 years to people that don't want to hear you. You're going to preach 40 years to stubborn-hearted people that are not going to listen to you, and eventually I'm going to bring my judgment on them. You feel like your whole ministry was in vain. And that's exactly what happened. Jeremiah preached 40 years to people that wouldn't listen. They wouldn't turn from sin. And then here is Jeremiah in the book of Lamentation. And his heart's broken. His eyes are rivers of tears. And for 18 months, he watches a siege of the Babylonians. People are dying. They're starving. Women are killing their children and eating them to survive. Lamentations 4.10 says that. And then you get all these words of Jeremiah. The book starts out like this in chapter 1, verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she is, who was great among the nations. The prince, the princess among the province has become a slave. She weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks among, among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Talking about Jerusalem and God's people. Verse 12 of that chapter 1. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Behold and see. If there is sorrow like my sorrow, which, is, which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted in the day of his spirit wrath. Here's a man with a spiritual burden. Here's a man seeing people being destroyed, the city of the great king being destroyed, people being taken off, starvation and dying all around him. And he's just, his heart's broken because of the destruction upon the people. Verse 16 for these things I weep. My eye, my eye overflows with water because the comforter who, who should restore my life is, is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Verse, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and my bone and bone my uh, uh, bone my bro my uh, my bones broken my bones and then he comes to chapter three verse sixteen and tw through twenty we're almost done he has also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes you have moved my soul far from peace and have forgotten prosperity and I said my strength and my hope had perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction and roaming the wormwood and the gall. This is Jeremiah's heart is so broken because of the rebellion and the judgment that have come because of that reaping. But then all of a sudden, his pessimism has changed. 
when we come to verse 23 and 20 to 23, what changes his attitude? It's the faithfulness of God. And he says this in Lamentations 3.20, My soul still remembers in the middle of all this. My soul, my soul still remembers and sinks within me. This I recall to mind. Therefore I have hope. In the middle of the most hopeless circumstance we could ever imagine, the prophet says, but I still have hope. I mean, no, there's nothing so bad that it's beyond the reach of God, the amen. It's beyond the faithful hand of God. It's be, it cannot, it'll never be on the promise and the power and the grace of God. And in the middle of where we are today or where you are or where somebody you may know in a dark place, we can bring this to mind and it's this, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And the great hymn, of course, was written. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. The faithfulness of God. He said, I'm the I am. I'm the, the so be it. What was Jeremiah doing? And I close. Jeremiah was doing this. And I would say it this way. If your joy is only dependent on what your natural eyes can see God doing, you're not going to have joy because we can't always see with our natural eyes. But with the eye of faith, Jeremiah says, I remember his faithfulness. Therefore, I have hope. And God took care of Jeremiah. In the middle of all that, God preserved him. We serve the I am today. No matter where you are today, no matter where you are today, in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the questions, middle of the pain, the disappointment, maybe the loss, in the middle of that, if we could just see there's a bright word of God that bursts forth out of our darkness. And it's this, his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness.